Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of BSD Synergy. This week's episode is entitled Wide Open BSD Spaces, and I'm your host, Mason Egger. So let's just get on into it. So this week I'm actually going to change things up a little bit. Um, I know on my last couple of videos I had said that I was going to be doing a full set of uh, free BSD things and then moving on to other BSDs. And after looking at my schedule and looking at all the things I wanted to cover in free BSD, it would actually have been a long time before I ever got to any of the other BSDs. And I wasn't okay with that. So I decided that what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually cover the rest of the BSDs, um, Open, Net, and Dragonfly, these next upcoming weeks. And then I'm going to go back to some really cool features on free BSD or Open BSD or any of the BSDs. So that being said, today we're going to be talking about OpenBSD. Now OpenBSD is a fork of NetBSD that happened, and I actually have an exact date for this, October 18th, 1995. Their primary focuses are security, correct code, documentation, and integrated cryptography. Now anybody who's ever worked with OpenBSD before knows that OpenBSD does kind of have a reputation. Uh, they have a reputation of being cranky, of sometimes the operating system having limited driver support, um, it's all about security. That's like, I hear that all the time about OpenBSD. One of the interesting things about the OpenBSD community in general is they're not trying to recruit you to use their operating system. They really don't care if you use it or not. Um, in their eyes, it's an operating system built by developers for developers. So what they do is they make sure that their documentation is spot on. That is one of their biggest things. It's actually considered a critical bug in software in any of the software packages if it is not properly documented. So the first thing they'll ask you to do if you ask a basic question on the messaging board, is to go RTFM. By all means, if you find a bug, they want you to tell them about it. But if you're not willing to read the manual or you know do the necessary research to learn how to do this yourself, they will quickly and quietly tell you to go back to Linux and continue with the problems that you're having that they had already solved a long time ago. Now that being said, it is a rather intricate community, and I actually really do like the community. Um, they kind of fit my kind of crazy, you know, things have to be right, and, you know, do it right or don't do it at all. That's a big motto in their community, and I really do like that motto. The OpenBSD community actually does drive a lot of innovation, you know. There are a lot of open source packages out there that were written by the OpenBSD community. Um... Libre SSL, Open BGPD, Open IKED, Open NTPD, Open SMTPD, uh, Open SSH. Yes, everybody's favorite SSH it was written by BSD. Uh, PF, Relay D, a whole bunch of things. Um, and they're very concerned about security in these packages. A really interesting story is, um, I think in release five nine, the the previous release, they actually replaced uh, Nginx as the default HTTPD on their. Uh, server and what they did is they wrote their own because they were bouncing bug reports back to Nginx about security issues and Nginx was not responding in a way that was making the OpenBSD people happy so they decided that hell with it we're just going to write our own and that actually is what happens in that community quite a bit and as I said you know they drive a lot of innovation they drive the innovation of open source communities by doing things and by breaking stuff dramatically um and forcing other people to fix it. A prime example of this is the uh, write XOR executable or WXORX um, security thing, you know, where your memory can either be writable or it can be executable, but it can't be both. Well, this is obviously a good thing for security because it stops you from a lot of buffer overflow attacks and such. But what happened is a lot of people, the compilers had the software for it, but nobody wanted to turn it on because it would break their stuff and they didn't want to fix it. So one of the things that happened in... Uh, I think around 2002, OpenBSD turned it on on all their compilers, and it broke everything. I'm talking massively broke so much third-party software. And what it did, what what that ended up doing was, um, is it forced people to reevaluate their code? You know, what kind of software did it break? You know, it broke software with bugs. It broke software that relied on buffer overflows to run, and it also broke software that just ran for the wrong reasons. So. They had a large enough user base that people would submit bug reports to these third-party softwares, and eventually the third-party softwares would be like, okay, we, we really do need to fix this, and they did. And, you know, th that's OpenBSD for you. They're like, okay, we're going to turn it on and break everything, and people are going to fix it, or they're not going to use it on, a, on our operating system anymore. And that's a pretty interesting way of dealing with stuff. I can't say that that approach works everywhere, but it works really well in their community, and I'm personally a fan of it. I wish I could be like, comply or go away. That would be great. One last note about OpenBSD is they're actually probably one of the few people that has a timetable for their release schedules. They release two a year uh, in May and then in September, November-ish. Uh, every year they release 
two releases and uh it comes out you, you can buy the cd set that's actually how they make the primary uh part of their money is they're not they're not sponsored by anybody they just sell the cd sets it comes out with artwork comes out with a song a whole bunch of really nifty things some stickers you know you buy the cd set and you get all of this open bsd memorabilia and actually i've never bought one before but i'm totally buying one for uh, openb 6.0 which is coming out september 1st so if you like this video and you really want to play with some open bsd i would recommend going over and downloading 5.9 uh, which is out right now and installing it, but be prepared for the 6.0 release because apparently there's supposed to be some really cool changes in the 6.0 release. So for today, I'm going to show you how to install on OpenBSD and go ahead and just get a basic OpenBSD server running. So let's just get on to that. And here we go with an installation. And we're going to install our keyboard layout, default layout, system host name, we're going to call it BSD Synergy. Uh, our available network interface. We're going to let DHCP go ahead and get that IP address. And there we go. We got a DHCP discover offer request and uh, ACK. So there we go. Uh, IPv6. I don't want one right now. Uh, configure. Nope. Uh, BSD Synergy. BSD Synergy. Starting SSHD by default. Uh, do we expect to run the XMINO system? No, because we're focusing on servers for today. Um, maybe later on in the future, I'll talk about doing an OpenBSD desktop. Uh, so we do not want... Do I want to set up a user? Actually, it's by default. No, I think I'm not. I'm, our root will allow. Uh, allow root SSH login? No, because I'm just going to use the console. What time zone I'm in? I can figure that out on its own. That's the disk. No valid MBR GPT. Uh, that's in Okay, so uh, we're going to use the whole disk. And these are the default partitions for everything. As you can see, everything inside of it is pretty much on its own separate partition. Um, I'll probably do a video later on how to actually partition OpenBSD. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You read the man page, you get it right away. But uh, if you don't read the man page, it's going to confuse you. So it's typical OpenBSD. Read the man page. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and do the auto layout because that's fine for now. And now we're going to install OpenBSD. And CD sets, they're going to be on the on the set, uh, or on the disk, disk, sorry, path name, that's the path. Okay, so this is actually, at the very beginning, you choose which sets of the base set of the base that you want. And actually, you can't see the last two sets on the far right-hand side because of my uh, my vid my box. Uh, those say X font 59 and X serve 59. Basically, it's all the X stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do minus X asterisk to turn off all of the X base things. I also don't need game because I don't plan on playing any games. Uh, RD, uh, BSD.MP means BSD multiprocessor, if you have multiprocessors. Uh, the, just your base, your comp, your man, it's all that. We're good with that. Um, the directory does not contain a SHA-56 signature. Do you want to continue without it? By default, it says no. I'm going to say yes, just because I know this is, I downloaded this directly, and I did a SHA-56 on the uh, ISO before I uh, ran it. And it's a VM that's not going into production, so I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, one of the interesting things is, is currently right now, I don't believe anybody has a deployable cloud image of OpenBSD, but in 5.9, Zen support was added. So hopefully soon, we'll start to see some OpenBSD in Oz, Rackspace, DigitalOcean, um, any of your major cloud providers. And the location of the sets, we're done. Time appears to be wrong. Go ahead and let it change. Now, one of the interesting things that I do want to mention is the op the install image. This was the entire install image for the OpenBSD thing. All the stuff was on there. You know, when you think of you know downloading from an ISO, you usually think of it being rather large. This ISO was 233 megabytes. <laughs> okay, so now we have this, and we need to reboot. I need to go into the settings real quick and remove the... Hopefully that did it. Did I hit it or did I miss it? Yeah. I missed it. I didn't get it. I didn't remove the disk quite quick enough, so we can reboot now.
Okay, and now we have OpenBSD. Okay, so one of the things that needs to be noted is that OpenBSD typically is a little bit more difficult to use, and I would say it's probably one of the most difficult to use of the BSDs. Um, not everything is as straightforward as it seems, and again, this is what the documentation is for, but when it comes to installing packages, it does some definitely interesting things that, you know, are probably done in the for the sake of security. For one, the ports tree, which also, like we discussed last week, is derived from the FreeBSD ports tree, um, is not directly on the machine at, at base install. You actually have to download the tar file of the ports, of the ports tree and install it. So we're going to cd into slash user. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and CVS is currently installed. This is a this is the way you would get it at for uh get the port tree. And I'm gonna copy this command from the documentation. And it's not gonna let me because it's a virtual machine. So we'll do CVS dash QD a non CVS at a non cvs.usa.openbsd.org colon slash cvs get dash r open bsd underscore breve you name dash r grep said s slash slash dot slash underscore slash breve dash p ports and that right there is pulling in the ports tree for us now I know that was a really complicated command but it's a really easy thing to find you just have to go look it up on the man pages uh, in OpenBSD which I will post a link to the man pages in the description below so now we're gonna pull the entire tree and I am gonna fast forward through this because pulling a tree you know Nothing against the operating system. This is literally network redundancy that's slowing us down here. Okay, and we just go, went ahead and skipped the installation of all those ports because, you know, that, that takes a while. So, if we go ahead, now we have the ports tree installed. And we go into cd slash user slash editors. User ports editors. And as you can see now, we have all of our typical editors. We have them we have emacs and then a whole bunch of other stuff that i've never seen before and really don't know what it is and i'm not really going to install anything from ports this time because as you saw in the previous videos it takes a while and but now you know you know it's pretty much the same thing you just cd into one of these things we'll say cd into vim and you just type make install and that will install the port now while installing from ports is you know traditionally the way to go in OpenBSD, they're not as averse to the packaging system. They actually have a decent packaging system, um, but again, it's not set up by default. Export PKG path equals HTTP colon darn it colon double backslash <sighs> mirror. Dot ESC seven dot net slash pub slash open BSD slash then we go back over here and then we do dollar sign you name dash R slash packages slash dollar you name dash m slash and if we echo pkg path gotta put the now we do pkg add vim and look and what it not only does it do that but it finds all of the different vims that are available so there's a lot of them let's just Go ahead and pick one. We're going to go ahead and go with uh, five. And the Vim with no X11. And with that, we now have Vim, which is cool, you know. Now, so the uh, the package manager for BSD is PKG add, and then you have delete to remove a package. You have info to display information about one, and then you have create for creating software packages. You know, it's in their pack their thing already, and then. 
I don't think there's a search, and there is no search, no. So if you want to be able to find software, it's best to just type in as best as you can, if not search the Mirror website for what you need. There's probably a similar uh, thing inside of the porch tree to uh, help you search for things, but again, this was not really written, you know, I hate to say that it's not really written to be easy to use, because, you know, it is pretty easy to use once you get used to it, but... This is, if there's one thing that I must say that keeps people away from OpenBSD in the beginning, it's because of the barrier to entry is like a brick wall. Now, if you read the manual pages and you read all the documentation before you do it, you know, that works. And it works pretty well. But if you're just going to try to jump into it and try it without actually doing your research, it's going to bite you in the ass and it's going to bitch slap you all the way across the room. That's just what OpenBSD does. You know, there was an old joke that, uh, you know, you know, Linux... Linux uh, laughs at you when you make a mistake, but kindly corrects it for you, and BSD punishes you for your mistakes. And while that's kind of an unfair joke, it does have its merits. And that's all I have today for OpenBSD. Uh, I kind of kept this one a little bit shorter than normal. There's a lot of different things in OpenBSD that I would like to go over. I, it personally, it is my favorite of the BSDs, and I'm going to save those for later videos. Um, one of the things that I do recommend is there are some wonderful books out there, and I'll hold this one up. This is Absolute OpenBSD. It's by Michael W. Lucas, um, and it's published by No Starch Press. If you haven't ever heard, seen, or heard of Michael's books, um, they're fantastic, but Google Michael W. Lucas, but make sure you remember that W, because Michael Lucas by itself apparently is a gay porn star, um... I did not find that out myself. It's a joke that he commonly makes in every interview or video that I've ever seen of him, so that's why I'm warning you ahead of time. OpenBSD does have an integral part inside of my network setup. Um, before I went to PFSense, all of my routing and all of my network stuff was actually done through OpenBSD servers. One of the main things that I've heard a lot of people say is that for production servers and stuff like that, FreeBSD, but if you want networking and you want security and all the things that kind of live like in the DMZ area or like on the network layer of your of your uh, network, OpenBSD is really the way to go. And that's all I have for this week. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe. Send it to your friends. Share it with everybody. I'm a, I'm a nice person. You know, I make slightly dumb jokes here every now and then. Hopefully people like them. Uh, but thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next week.